You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your consumerist ska kid host, Abraham. (laughs) I think I am your angsty hardcore kid host, Shane. Sure. We're a psychology podcast. We talk about all the things that people do and understanding why they do those things and looking at them in periods of time and when they're born and how their birth and their generation relates to previous generations and that sort of thing. And it just helps us just learn about each other, I guess. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. And every now and again, we do episodes that instead of asking why we do what we do, that is one question. But another question we have is why we are who we are. Yeah. And why are we the age that we are? Uh Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. Sometimes that's because of birth. Yeah. Because (laughs) that's that's how time works, I guess. That's how time works, (laughs) y'all. Anyway, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. And whether or not you're here for the first time, we can wish all of you for joining us a happy card reading day. Yes. It's also International Mother Language Day. And National Grain-Free Day for you celiac peoples and people who just don't want to have grains. Yes, but for those of you who do want grains, it's also National Sticky Bun Day, which, you know, I think of the sticky buns I had in Hawaii on a weekly basis. Weirdly, it's also Real Bread Week, so I'm not sure how to square all of those things, but uh, bread is happening. Either it doesn't have grains or it does, and it might be sticky, it might not. Who knows? It's Bread is, is happening. I wonder if Real Bread Week was a response to National Grain Free Day. Somebody was like, no. Yeah, it does feel targeted, right? Yeah, it's or it was big bread, you know, like there's the big (laughs) bread industry that's like really trying to get you in there. Could be. One of my favorite things is that it's my daughter's 18th birthday. I have, as as of today, congratulations, Riley. I have raised a child to an adult and kept them alive for 18 years, which in itself, I think, is a feat. That is. That is an accomplishment. (laughs) <laughs> people who don't have kids don't know how difficult it is to, to pull something like that off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's common, but it's a, it's a lot of work. Yeah. A, a, lot, a lot of people do it. it and a lot of people fail at it. So, you know, yeah, here we are. Anyway, related to raising children is that it is future farmers of America week or day. I don't remember. It's it's, it is a celebration of the future farmers of America. Were you ever part of that group? I was not. Uh, oh, it is week. Okay. I was able to, to double check. I kind of I had this experience that's probably worth talking about in an episode about when we grew up and the things that we experienced. <laughs> but I had this experience early on that like I kind of at the point that I would have become a part of certain communities, it was too late for them for me to be like joining. And like as an example, my family didn't really go to church very often and I was all I felt the call at some point when I was very young and I was like we need to go to church. And we went and they're like, what is this outsider doing here? Like, we don't want you in our church. I was like, all right, I guess I won't come to your church then. Yeah, bye. Not big on recruiting, (laughs) y'all. And that happened like in multiple sectors. And I think the Future Farmers of America was another one that by the time I found it, they were sort of like, we kind of have our crew now, so you can just not come over here. You can't hang out with our pigs. Yeah. That was a lot to say about that. Just saying that that was a holiday. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry, I, I was just curious because we had one here and I was just like, I never got to be a part of it either. So yeah, it was just oranges anyway. Yeah, it's, it's just oranges and alligator farms. So <laughs> it's also National Condom Week. All right. Yeah. Which is fun. Yeah. Celebrate the contraception. It is Alzheimer's. I was going to say this is related, but it's not. I don't think. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Alzheimer's <Nope>. disease and <laughs> dementia staff education week. Yeah. This is also completely unrelated. It is Bird Health Awareness Week. Hmm. Take care of your birds. <laughs> Love teaching week, which which I do, so I'm I'm good with that. Me too. And it's National Sauna Week, so uh, stay toasty, my friends. And finally, through with the chew, which is to say chewing tobacco week. If you're trying to quit, now is the time. Make this your week and stop chewing tobacco, maybe, if you want to. Oh, my gosh. You know, playing baseball in the South, there were so many people that, like, so many kids on our baseball teams that would do chew sure. and have dip and i was like you're 14 what are you doing the critical part of the sport can't swing a bat if you uh, can't it's... chew on mulch yeah exactly Ugh. Ugh. well we're actually not talking about all of the holidays or tobacco or anything like that although in a way we kind of are we are talking about the history of the united states or more specifically the people in the united states this is going to be an unfortunately kind of american centric episode although we will touch on how and if this relates to other countries around the world 
but we're talking about the generations of people that have lived over the last century or so in the United States. And with those generations come specific labels and many times a lot of their personalities and their behaviors are attributed to the time that they were born, specifically looking at generations. So we are going to talk about those generation characteristics, I think, a little bit. So maybe I guess we just dive in. So a generation, just for just for the sake of this episode, a generation is a group of people born around a similar time period. And that similar time period is about 15 years We see generations kind of account for about 15 years of time, these groups of folks. Yeah, kind of 15 to 20. And I think that part of it is they look at that as being 20 years. A lot of people historically were becoming parents right around that point. And so then their children were the next generation of the family. So that's kind of how it's dissected. It's not exactly that, but that's that's more or less how it was broken up. And anyway, these ideas of generations, these 15 year periods in history that are kind of relatively static, actually, they're pretty static. (laughs) The idea of this is that each generation is characterized by a set of world events and circumstances that sort of shapes the behavior of everyone who lived during that time period such that they have some we can talk about them as belonging to that group, if you will. Right. So hypothetically, this means that people of each generation will have characteristic behaviors, values and work ethic specific to that generation. And you'll see kind of what we mean when we begin to unpack that. But the idea is that every person in that group has had at least major world events that have kind of led to how they behave, how they act, how they interact with the world around them. And also kind of related to what their parents had. And what they grew up with and how that would then affect how their parents behave toward their children. And so the point, I guess, or the the sort of working thesis for the generations and how they might be identifiable by their characteristics is that these are people who grew up during a point where society and economic pressures and the prevailing technologies that we'll get into mm-hmm. are ubiquitous for almost all people, particularly inside of a single country, even if they're sort of at varying degrees of intensity and accessibility to that country, you know, they are more or less available. So like when the internet became available, not everybody had the internet and it's still not everybody does, although almost everybody does. So that would have affected people differently during that time. But just as an example of how the circumstances, once they become more widespread and they affect a lot of people, how that then comes to influence or define or be related to the sort of understanding that is applied to that generation. You know, I think about the Internet a lot. In relation to my kids, because I think of like, I remember, and I'm sure, and you remember too, growing up without it. Like there was a period of time where the internet did not exist in our world. Yeah, that's true. And so like they say, like our generation is like the last generation that lived without internet um, before like it became so ubiquitous because my kids were born well after the internet was established and they have never known a life without it. Yeah. It's really fascinating to kind of dive into. And I think every generation has something like that. And we'll kind of yeah. maybe get into those. But I do think it is is important to kind of note that these lines that we're talking about, these generational lines and divides are completely arbitrary. And it's well understood that they are. The choice to delineate one generation from another includes such variables as demographics, attitudes, historical events, pop culture, prevailing consensus among researchers. Those are kind of the things they look at. And as a result, uh, and this is a direct quote from the demographics part, I apologize. As a result, the lines that define generations are useful tools for analysis, but they should be thought of as guidelines rather than hard and fast distinctions. So these are not hard and fast rules. They are just kind of like a general overview and like just a kind of an accounting of contextual variables for these folks. Yeah, that's how a lot of people talk about it and how they see it. And so in thinking about the fact that these people are sort of going through these major world events at particular times during their development It sort of begs the question, then, can this macroscopic zoomed out analysis of circumstances, global circumstances, sort of current pop culture circumstances, can they tell us so much about the variables that impact human behavior that we can reliably expect from people of that generation to act a certain way or have certain values or have an anticipation of how they're going to show up in their work and work ethic. Can we do that? Like, is that something that is afforded by even diving into this analysis? 
I think the other question I have is like, is it useful? We will get into that. Yeah. And we are going to talk about whether or not it's useful. So I'm so glad that we are. So what we're going to talk about and what we're going to unpack now are what those generations are currently that we have been kind of discussed quite a bit. What are those characteristics? Like what that generational gap is? And also what do skeptics say about it? Because I think it's important to know kind of the questions. And and I I think I I tend to be one of the skeptic side of this too, kind of being like, well, what does this even mean? Or how is this useful? And so we're going to kind of dive into all that. So Abraham, what are the generations? Well, first I'll actually, before I I reveal them and we'll, we'll go through them all one at a time, but I will say that what's kind of interesting is most of the places that I looked said we're at seven generations in the United States. <laughs> That's, That's it. it. Um, <laughs> and and I think that what this has to do with, and I think this is a really, we'll see this as we unpack these generations, but I think what this has to do with is because it's really over the last century that they've identified these generations Yeah, that at no point in history has the world changed as rapidly as it has in the last century. And and we were talking about this a little bit off air before we before we hit record that like the difference between the country, the United States from 1812 to 1912 had a couple of really substantial major events. But right. That was kind of it. It was like there was a, a few really big things that happened over that hundred years from 1820 to 1920. 1920 to 2020 was incredible <laughs> difference. I mean, yeah, it has gone through major, massive cataclysmic shifts such that we've never seen anything quite like it before. Yeah. We went from Jinkos to skinny jeans to back to Jinkos. It's been <laughs> it's been a boomerang of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> well, and like, if you think about like women's suffrage is barely a, a century old, like, right. We went from basically having no international travel to frequent regular international travel. That by itself is a huge change. We went sure. from like technology being as complicated as like basically a lamp, a butter churner <laughs> yeah. from 1920s. I mean, I guess technically as complicated as like we had refrigerators back then to AI. Right. Now our refrigerators talk to us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Even 1720 to 1820, not that much, like a lot changed, but not that much changed, not relative to today. So every time you look at a century going back, like all of them had their turmoil and their changes and their shifts and and major political and social upheavals, like all those things happened, but now they're happening at exponential rate. So all that I could really find in looking back on this is that most people draw generations as starting around the turn of the 20th century, right around 1900. Okay. And so then from right. there, they've outlined these generations and I'll just quickly go through them. There's the greatest generation. And then the silent generation, both of those can be grouped together to be called the traditionalists as a generation. So that's a little confusing in there. Uh Then you have the more well-recognized baby boomers, generation X, millennials, also called generation Y, generation Z or Gen Z. And then the most recent one is Gen Alpha, which is where we're in the midst of that, uh, that birth wave. And we'll talk about all the sort of time periods that those are meant to encapsulate. But that's just a list of what they are. I think this is going to be really fun, and I, I'm so excited we're covering this topic. I will say, though, what is not fun is something that was created by the greatest generation. It feels like it was, and that is advertising. All right. So we had the effect of those earlier generations, that is, <laughs> advertisements that have become inescapable in so many places. Fortunately, at the time of this, you probably still have your your skip ahead button on your listening device. <laughs> Fingers but, crossed. <laughs> hopefully. But let's start with the greatest generation or the traditionalists, depending on how you want to slice it. And we'll talk through them. Yes. So this group was born either from 1901 to 1924 or 1900 to 1945. But we're going to focus on that slice of uh, 1901 to 1924 specifically. That generation, the greatest generation, is characterized by optimism, belief in the American dream, value of community, personal responsibility, and there was there was a theme I saw of just generally respect for authority as a characteristic value in the greatest generation. Right. And so there were a couple defining circumstances that would have led to maybe some kind of general behaviors for these folks. There was World War One. It's kind of a big deal. 
Yeah. There was the 1918 flu pandemic, also a big deal. People of this generation came of age during the Great Depression. Most of the Americans who served during World War II were from this generation. They experienced the once-in-a-lifetime social, economic, and political upheaval. There's a lot going on during that time. And Tom Brokaw said of this generation, quote, The greatest generation of Americans, men and women who fought not for fame or recognition, but because it was the right thing to do, end quote. And uh, apparently this is where that generation gets its name is from Tom Brokaw. Yeah. That's what it found in the resources that I was look I was looking for uh, in in the preparation of this, and, and just remember again that like in this generation, this greatest generation that is so uh, so hailed by those nostalgists is that this was still largely during Reconstruction and like Jim Crow. This is prior to civil rights. Women gained suffrage only at the very tail end of this period of time when we're talking about that 1901 to 1924. And so just like keeping in mind that things weren't (laughs) so good back then. Right. I think that's really important. Like when people kind of like romanticize certain decades and stuff, it's like, y'all know that it probably wasn't as good as it seems, right? Like, yeah, it it probably wasn't that great. So further to understand a little bit more of what was going on at that time, interstate travel was still pretty uncommon. Lead was starting to be added to gasoline and paint, which uh, (laughs) was a problem. (laughs) Houses cost about $6,000. Smoking was considered normal. Movies were just barely getting started, as was recorded music. And people were still enamored with the invention of the telephone. So there were even places where municipal plumbing wasn't available. So this is still, there's a lot going on and people are still fairly isolated in this space. And there's still some just kind of like needs for advancements in other areas. Yeah. I think that at this point we just barely had elevators like showing up fairly. I mean, I think that the elevators had debuted well before this, but they weren't really building buildings in mind with elevators right until like the late 1800s. I think I could have my history wrong there. So like they just weren't even that common still uh, in the 1920s. Okay, so that was the greatest generation or so overlapping with this idea of the traditionalists, followed by then the silent generation, which also then overlaps with the idea of the traditionalists because the silent generation would be people who were born between 1928 and 1945, or again, the traditional is born between 1900 and 1945. So we're, there's that overlap thing there. Right. And so this generation, some of the common values that are listed are communication, collaboration, teamwork, stability, and loyalty. So those are some, or there are some other folks that say dedication and sacrifice, discipline, adhering to rules, delayed reward, respect for authority, patience, patriotism, hard work, responsibility. And so when when you kind of break it all down, there's a lot of like, I think really great buzzwords for like right. the upstanding citizen yeah. and traditionalists value loyalty and subservience to their benevolent employer and seek to clearly understand their place in the hierarchy of things, which I think um, actually explains a lot about like careerists. Yeah. Or at least there's like a discussion around careerists in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, and I mean, that's kind of because there was that overlap, but so the defining circumstances of this, and, and we'll start by the the term silent generation was apparently coined in a Time Magazine article in 1951, and they said, quote, by comparison with the flaming youth of their fathers and mothers, today's younger generation is a still small flame. It does not issue manifestos, make speeches, or carry posters. It has been called the silent generation, end quote. And so that's, they're sort of like saying that relative to the previous generation, these are people not making as much of a a splash. They're not really trying to make their voices heard. They're trying to get by. Now, again, to put this into context, because this is people born between 1928 and 1945, these are largely children during World War II. And they're the children of vocal, loud parents who fought in the war, who suffered through the Depression. Right. So that's sort of where their parents were coming from. And they saw sort of all that upheaval, and then they didn't have that going on for them, at least not in the same way. And so at this point, the country was experiencing an era of relative stability and economic growth. Besides the persistence of Jim Crow era bigotry, more people were experiencing an unprecedented level of equality with it, with people having access to voting, as well as people were, you know, women were had gone into the workforce during World War II, so there was more employment to go around. And also they were all suffering from brain damage from all the lead that was in everything. <laughs> yeah. Microwaves were just invented. And during this time, the first freeway is built in the United States. 
Right. And I think when you go back and you watch some of the like news stories and some of the advertising and some of the things that were going on around this time, like for this generation, there's so much idealism going on. There's so much like American way. There's so much like the future of the United States. And like there's so much that voice. I feel like that (laughs) voice comes from the silent generation, even though they were the silent generation, because there was so much of like, you know, like you said, they were children during the war. So they were dealing with. The results in the aftermath of the war, right? Like when they were coming up, they were dealing with a lot of their caregivers not really coping with their own traumas from the war and some of that type of stuff. I mean, there are so many unique things that were impacting them uh, as they were coming up. And I think that's an important thing, too. The, The characteristics and the experiences of the previous generation are going to influence the the next generation. Like if you fought in World War Two, then your experience is going to heavily influence how you interact with human beings after you come home from world war ii yeah and that's that's it's a great point to keep in mind as we go through this is the fact that part of the circumstances even if we don't explicitly say it every time will be what the previous generation's sort of circumstances were and how that shaped how they may or may not have behaved toward the subsequent generation and how the subsequent generation sees, feels, and feels the effects of the struggles from the previous generation. Because, you know, we have language, so we can sort of pass those things on and, and, uh, and, and remember with wisdom the things that went wrong terribly in history that we should not repeat. Just as a through line, I think this and this is something that like I don't think it can be attributed to generations specifically, but I do think it's important, like some of the language narratives that occur. You know, when you talk about traditionalists and then you talk about the Cold War. Like the Cold War is a direct result of people being afraid of communism, which started in this like American, like isolationist kind of viewpoint, this type of patriotism that occurred during the greatest generation and the silent generation type of time period. Right. Like there was so much isolationism going on and so much red scare going on that it makes perfect sense. that The Cold War would have happened later. Speaking of the Cold War, (laughs) we get to the generation (laughs) that I think most people recognize as a generation, and that's the baby boomers. Yeah. So the baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964, and their values include personal growth, optimism, anti-war, don't trust people over 30, personal gratification, personal growth, team oriented, spend now, worry later, work, make a difference and question everything. Yes. So I found this sort of document that outlines all the various values, and they were they were a little bit silly, but I sort of tried to pull in uh, where I saw common themes across multiple resources, and also throw it pepper in a few of the ones that I thought were a little more eccentric and specific to that document. But so as you said, the circumstances of people in this generation were kind of the Cold War. I mean, we had the Cold War during this, although it would have started when they uh-huh. were all babies. Right. But baby boomers, they were called the baby boomers because there was this sudden rapid increase in, in the number of children as soldiers came home from the war were eager to start their families and then abandon, abuse, neglect, and beat their families with some exceptions. Sure. <laughs> joke, 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 joke. But I mean, it, it was legitimately that they came home and were like starting their families. And so like once everyone came home from the war, there was this massive influx of babies everywhere. And because of this unprecedented increase in citizens, resources were stretched thin and competition for jobs, education and opportunity became fierce. And that meant that because there were so many people who were trying to get into the workforce when they started becoming adults, employers had their pick of employees and employees would have to fight like hell to keep their jobs. Which I think is a big deal coming from a generation before where everybody was loyal to their career, loyal to their companies and like having that kind of careerist type of viewpoint where now it's like an employee could pick and choose or an employer could pick and choose whoever they wanted and send somebody packing. And now it's like you start I I, I could see I could imagine that there is probably kind of the seeds of um, anti corporate anti that kind of like anti-careerist viewpoints like, well, I can't trust that I'm going to be here forever, so I'm not going to be loyal or subservient to this employer. You sort of hit it is like there was I'm not going to say distrust, but there was a little bit of anti-establishment attitude that started to build. But also because they were so often afraid of losing their job, they might be very fiercely loyal to their employer. Right. There was definitely some resentment that built, but you'd also have people who would like really, really try. Like they worked really hard to keep their job, which meant loyalty and subservience. And so we'd see some sort of repeated themes, I think, across these generations. Yeah, absolutely. 
nevertheless, or perhaps because of some of this stuff, this generation led kind of like the all the stuff that we're talking about led to progressive anti-war movements, civil rights activism. And we're the first generation to grow up with technology in the form of calculators. Just kidding. There was there was other technology before that, but they actually had the first video game that came out in this generation. They also had vinyl records. They had movies that were starting to get better. They were starting to get more accessible. Smoking was allowed on planes. Oral birth control became available and there were photocopiers. Also, drugs were pretty abundant at this time. People (laughs) were really stoked about drugs. So there was that going on, too. That was definitely a thing. And the term baby boomer can actually be traced back to an article in the Daily Press which is a apparently still active Virginia-based newspaper, in a headline that read, Baby Boomers Grown Up Storm Ivy-Covered Walls. And this really was an article which lamented the substantial increase in college enrollments by students who were, as it was described in the article, they lacked experience, determination, and clearly defined goals. A paraphrase, but close to a direct quote. (laughs) And I think it's really important to highlight This particular generation, because I think that there is inside the kind of like current tensions, like cultural generational tensions, like the okay boomer, baby boomer, like that generation does not sound like what we just described. Right. Like like currently they don't sound anything like what we just described, but this is kind of an interesting thing as you kind of move through history. I think it's kind of funny in this article to say that these college enrollment, like these students who are enrolling in college for the first time lacked experience. I was like, do a lot of. Freshmen have a lot of college experience (laughs) prior to this. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Exactly. It's so it's such a bizarre thing. Yeah. Like I felt like an odd thing to point out. Like these college students aren't even college students yet. Like, yeah, that's that's why they enrolled. (laughs) Isn't that the trope with psychology, too? It's like I need experience, but I can't get experience because nobody will hire me to give me experience. So true. Now I'm going to go back to uh, working at Starbucks. (laughs) Just have to work for free or for insanely cheap, you know, for somebody for a while. (laughs) Yeah, that's fine. Or free or, you know, uh, or you pay somebody or whatever. Yeah, you might pay them to work there. Yeah. Yeah. Dentured servitude. Speaking of getting paid, here are some ads. Okay, so, so far we've covered the greatest generation, the silent generation, the traditionalists, that is both of those generations, and the baby boomers, and then we get into the next big era that I think less well known by its name, but people often talk about this, and this is Generation X or Gen X, and these are people born between 1965 and 1980. These are my parents. Right. My parents are Gen Xers, which explains my general sardonic sense of humor and cynicism towards the world so mine were both baby boomers so oh, there you go and look we're the same we're the same look and at us the- <laughs> it's so strange how that works it's because we're both millennials now the generation x not the band but the generation themselves their <laughs> values include things like being a workaholic independence autonomy balance diversity fun uh, my parents had too much fun <laughs> entrepreneurship education pragmatism life balance self-reliance skepticism and techno literacy which is really fascinating Yeah. Well, in the defining circumstances, if you're thinking about what's going on during 1965 and 1980 and reiterating the point that like they're going to be influenced by the parents who grew up with all the circumstances of the previous generation and that how that may have influenced their attitudes and their behaviors and that sort of thing. But in in the Gen X circumstances, you had drugs in the Vietnam War and the Cold War. Those are the big ones. Those are the big things. (laughs) They also had the first person to land on the moon happened when they were kids, this was nearly at the peak of serial killer activity toward the end of this, the serial killer activity in the U S you know, before violent video games really started taking off. And right after lead paint was a real hit. (laughs) Yeah. Increasingly (laughs) both parents were working during this time, which meant that kids took care of themselves for pop culture references. The movie jaws introduced the concept of the summer blockbuster, which had not been a thing before this Mm -hmm. lead had, as you said, lead had finally been banned from paint (laughs) at the end of the seventies. So sort of right in the middle of this rock and roll was the predominantly popular music style. The U S was about to experience some of the worst economic policies of all time. And the subsequent generation, the AIDS epidemic was preparing to launch into a furious onslaught that would claim the lives of tens of thousands of Gen Xers as they reached adulthood. And uh, yeah, so they, they had a lot going on. Yeah. So then no wonder Nirvana was big in the, in the nineties. <laughs> like, I mean, this was a time where grunge was rife for uh, like coming up. Like there's no way it was going to not going to happen. Everybody was really bummed out. 
I mean, this generation is very bummed out. <laughs> so Robert Capa was a photographer who was trying to capture what life was like for people who grew up after World War II. He dubbed these folks, this this generation that we're talking about, Gen X, which was later solidified in the 1991 book called Generation X, Tales for an Accelerated Culture by Canadian author Douglas Copeland or Coupland. Douglas Copeland's written all kinds of Copeland's written all kinds of stuff. Now, other people called this the post boomer generation, the latchkey generation and the 13th generation, which I think is really fascinating. But I've always known them as Gen X. Right. Yeah. And Gen X was the one that really stuck the most. I could see why post boomer would sort of work. And the latchkey kid thing, that was the reference to the fact that you had more working parents. And so kids were kind of taking care of themselves and just kind of running around mm-hmm. doing whatever and getting snatched up by serial killers. Yeah. That was sort of where, where that term there came from. It's a wild time. Yeah. All right. Now we get to the mo- the dreaded millennials, Ooh. also called Gen Y. And it's us. Hey. This is people born between 1981 and 1996. We're definitely in that period yeah we won't tell you exactly when though <laughs> which we've probably said a couple times on the episode sure so we we're late stage millennials so our our values include achievement civic duty consumerism fun fun extreme fun morals confidence competition personal attention extreme technology savvy optimism street smarts and spiritualism now i was reflecting on this And going through this list and having the thought that I'm like, it's actually eerily accurate, I feel like, to myself, how much of that I do identify with, Yeah, except the spiritualism part. (laughs) I relate to the spiritualism part in terms of, like, not necessarily religion, but, like, just feeling like a oneness with the universe and feeling, like, connected. Like, that's probably where my spiritualism comes in. I also find a lot of spiritualism in, like, the experience around music, but... Sure. Okay. But that's about as far as that goes. Okay. All right. Defining circumstances of the millennials, who, again, were the sort of early to mid 90s here. There's kind of a lot going on. The AIDS epidemic really went into full swing Mm -hmm. and reached its zenith of slaughter during this period. International politics began escalating quite a bit as we got more policies and just more interconnected as various countries men like our shipping and political and economic policies started to really influence one another internationally. Also, computers, I think. (laughs) Yay! This became the era of personal computers. Uh, We also had the initial development of mobile phones that started to become popular and people had them. Beepers. Yeah, beepers, right? (laughs) In pop culture, we had Queen, Michael Jackson, Pantera, Nirvana, Tool, Metallica. For movies, we had E.T., Indiana Jones, Ghostbusters, Star Wars, starting Empire Strikes Back, Uh Die Hard, Jurassic Park, Fight Club, Titanic, Forrest Gump, and The Shawshank Redemption, just to name a few. And the most violent video games ever were released during this time, or at least the most violent video games up to this point. And we finally saw a decrease in the rate of active serial killers during this time. Also, fun enough, underground music became successful enough to fund itself and became sort of an uh-huh. individual enterprise, and that's how we got punk and ska into their second, third, and fourth waves. Ah, the best time. I think every generation probably feels like this, but I feel like this era, like the that era for, for music, is some of the best ever. From like the beginning of the 80s until like the mid to late 90s is like the best. That's just the best. So, but I even forgot to say, you know, Fleetwood Mac uh, was in this this time too. And Ninja Turtles. Oh, that's right. And Ninja Turtles, man. And Beetlejuice. Did you say they're putting a sequel out to Beetlejuice? It's called Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I did not. I'm very curious about that. Brilliant. <laughs> so <laughs> what happens when you release the third one? <laughs> oh, no. I was going to ask you, though, as someone who is so avidly familiar or avidly is maybe not the word, but more uh, familiar with the history of punk. Like when we're talking to 1981, sort of what what wave of punk are we in at this point? Oh, that's like the first wave of punk. I mean, you're talking like end of the 70s. People are getting real sick of like glam rock. Like people are getting real tired of like Foreigner and Boston and Aerosmith and and all that nonsense. And so you started finding bands that were kind of coming up with a harder edge. And like the late 70s, you saw the Ramones show up. Okay. The Ramones started touring late 70s, like the beginning of the 80s. And basically they were considered the Johnny Appleseed of punk rock. And so they would go to whatever city and they would play and people would be like, hey, I could do that too. And they would go get a guitar. <laughs> and that's when you ended up with like all these punk bands all over the country. If you read about the history of punk inside New York, it was so interesting because New York itself was like this kind of really dangerous space. Sure. And punk rock was kind of like the flagship for that. But it really started with the Stooges in the se- in the late 70s. And then right at the beginning of the 80s, you had 
Ramones, Black Flag, Bad Religion. You had like Seven Seconds, uh, Uniform Choice, SSD. You had all these bands that started coming up and in everywhere. And it was like, it burned real hot. Like that was the thing about that time. It burned real hot. It burned real quick. And then like shut down like by like 1985. And then there was a revival like in the late eighties. And that's when you started seeing grunge and like the pop, the pop punk boom in like early nineties. Right. Cause I mean, actually, you know, even Blink-182 was like, they started during this period. Um, like I yeah, think yeah. their first sort of demo and Buddha came out. I want to say in like 90 three or something like that it was like 93 or 94 yeah because yeah. uh dude ranch was 97 right yeah punk and rock were kind of the way to go but anyway pop culture really fun i think prior to like there being the access to this kind of underground music like bands that weren't really syndicated they didn't really have albums it was kind of expected that you'd go, you'd join a band you'd play at clubs and like people would go to see live music and that was perfectly fine like people just kind of did that thing and then they're sort of like we're really going to do our own thing we're going to tour we're going to make our own albums we're going to go out and this DIY version of a music yeah. industry started to creep up and with it came this sort of counterculture revolution i mean like every every group of people had some rebellion against their parents go on in some version or way, but this really hit its stride when you had these groups of people that were connected by their music and how that shaped their values and their community that just became much stronger, I think, during this time. Yeah. And it was just like nothing that people had really seen before. You're right. I think that's where like that street smarts value comes in because you have like as an example, Uniform Choice was like one of the first bands to start doing their own merch, their band merch, like mm. for themselves. They weren't like shipping that off to go get shirts printed for tours and stuff like they were doing it in their houses, in their in their homes, putting them in their trunks and like going on tour or Brett Gurowitz from Bad Religion starting Epitaph Records in the 80s was mm. absolutely a response to record industries like just like, you know, screwing over bands and stuff. Same thing with Ian McKay and Discord Records like Minor Threat is a perfect example of how like that DIY culture, that self-reliance culture started in the music industry, especially in underground music right around that time. Like it was kind of there, but it didn't like blossom until like the eighties, which is really, really interesting. I mean, that's why, you know, you had so many punk bands that are kind of doing their own thing for so many years, like, cause they could, and they could make a pretty decent living off of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, before it just really was not accessible. You could not set up some kind of recording outfit without having like tens of thousands of dollars to invest prior to this. And all of a sudden technology got good enough that you kind of could. And I mean, it wasn't yeah. necessarily always cheap, but you could get access to the, the stuff you needed and for at least good enough that you'd be able to make semi listenable uh, records. And then as, <laughs> as they reinvested right. the money that they made from their self-funded project where they got to keep all the money for that was an output of their work, then they could get better and better equipment. And so, yeah, you actually, did have as you said those record labels could afford then to support these little indie projects and you get this weird blend of like these are actual businesses that do actually make money off of their bands and they're super small right just like little little operations but it's enough that like it has its own little economy and built into it which was really interesting super fascinating super super cool that was a, a huge pop culture <laughs> sign tangent about that. Uh, we'll wrap up with the millennials by talking about a, another really critical feature. As I said, computers were huge. I mean, they were such a disruptive catalyst of events. And this is even before we really move into how they become more disruptive. But that was a pretty big game changer at that point. And, yeah. and also, this is the point at which like computers had been around prior to this. Like, let's make sure we're really clear that like this wasn't when computers were developed. But this was the point at which you got personal computers and where computers became user friendly enough that most lay people could learn them. But they were complicated and not user friendly enough that we all sort of learned, had to learn how to overcome their failings and shortcomings and figure out how to sort of repair them kind of on our own. Yeah. And also, just as a quick side note, this we had a rare moment of economic triumph during this generation when we temporarily in the United States had a budget surplus 
during the Clinton administration. Yeah. Also, you could fly planes without having to endure hours of security screenings. Whew. That was also just a thing. What a strange time. I remember being in school, and I think this was the first time that I had become acutely aware of politics because mm. Clinton was running, and everybody was like, he's the cool one. He plays saxophone and eats McDonald's. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'll vote for him, like not knowing anything about politics or how Sure. Any of it worked. I was like, I'll vote for him. Because I also remembered George H.W. Bush being on The Simpsons and being a villain on The Simpsons. So like <laughs> he had moved in across the street from The Simpsons oh, and, yeah. and they and, and Homer got in a fist fight with him. So yeah. like I remember being like, Boo Bush, yay, Clinton at the time when I was like five. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like that's when uh Homer accidentally destroys his memoirs. It's like <laughs> yes. giant stack of paper. He's been typing diligently on a little typewriter for uh-huh. so long. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. That's the one. That's the episode. Okay. Yeah. The Simpsons, another huge cultural, culturally relevant <laughs> icon that occurred during this point. Well, that's when they started. Obviously, they are still going on. South Park, I think, started during this time. It may have been a little yep. after because it was the late 90s, mid to late 90s when that started. I want to say it was like 95 or 96, maybe even 94. That feels that, that feels about right. That feels okay. about right. I actually remember because I remember I went to, uh, I'd never heard of South Park before. I'd never seen an episode and I show it at elementary school one day and and everyone's like, Kenny didn't die. And I was like, was he, what does that mean? Was he supposed to? <laughs> yeah, that was a big deal. I remember when that, I remember when that happened. That was a big yeah. deal. Yeah. I was like, is that a thing that we say about people sometimes? <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. What a time to be alive. Yes. Speaking of times to be alive, not during ads. We're back and we can punctuate these generations with ads, apparently, because that's how long we're taking. (laughs) Yeah, I think that one in particular, I think we have a a very particular bias for the millennial time period. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to say about that one. Yeah. For us. For us, at least. Yeah. But following Gen Y comes gen z right if we're following alphabet the alphabet and all that (laughs) so sometimes you'll hear them referred to as zennials i've heard zennials as another term for them all right which i feel like gen z is fine they were born between 1997 and 2012 and their values include empathy progressiveness diversity inclusion flexibility teamwork professional growth tech nativism and social and political awareness yes with tech nativism, largely it's like these are people who are born during a point where they don't know a world without mobile phones and internet. Right. That has only ever been around. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, like there are people who are around now who are like going into middle school who have never lived in a world that did not have iPads. That is the thing. Yeah. Some of the defining characteristics here, I think, are going to stand out. Like there was a major world event, or at least United States centric, but also world events that took place. We had 9 11, one of the big ones, yep. in 2001. Because of that, and because of how politics are progressing, you had a rise in xenophobia and jingoism. The fourth ever instance of a president winning the electoral vote while losing the popular vote, a trend that would become comically and depressingly common from then into the foreseeable future. Yeah, We had a broader understanding of global climate change as an issue that was becoming made aware to the people of the Gen Z generation. We had the rise of the gig economy. We had the the takeover of Amazon and just regular retail marketplaces. Uh-huh. We have the rise of cryptocurrency starting to at the Ugh. end of this. We have the transition to smartphones, which I think also one of the most significant disruptive technologies we've ever had. Yeah. We had in pop culture, the rise of the MCU. Awesome. We had music moved to streaming. Uh-huh. Technology reached a point, and so computers specifically reached a point where they became so user-friendly that no one knows what to do if it breaks. <laughs> right. <laughs> and more sort of pop culture-y things. Yeah, I mean, you also had Netflix and the Redbox, those types of services that end up kind of shutting down rental stores, sending them into functional extinction. you got Star Wars comes back, kind of. You've got Lord of the Rings, The Matrix, Harry Potter, Twilight, The Office, which are all, you know, I think important works of art. Yeah. And you've got musicians kind of give up and just start releasing the same three songs over and over again from then until the foreseeable future. I mean, you can kind of overlay literally every pop song and they all sound the same. They just they just gave up. They're like, well, computers can do our work now. And yeah, 
that's it. That's where they stop making. It's music. a wild time. It's a yeah. wild time for music uh, in terms of like stagnancy. The underground is 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 doing just fine. Just I was, so was going to say, like, like there are still video music stores that are out there, or, or no, video music video rental stores that are out there that you can still go and rent and rent movies from. And there are still musicians who are out there learning how to play instruments and writing songs. That still is a thing. And most of what's out there is like streaming services for movies. And most of what's out there is just the people who just say, make me song computer or uh-huh. like, I'm just going to make that same song, but I'm going to do it in this chord instead. Yep. And that's what's happened. Absolutely. Okay. Well, what comes after Gen Z or Zillennials, I guess you might wonder. <laughs> little. Well, essentially, the idea of what happened next is that you have the next generation that was the first generation born during the 21st century. And this is called, right. because of that, Gen Alpha. Gen Alpha, which, you know, I think about my son in this situation, and I, I don't know that I would describe him as an alpha. He's so, like, kind and sweet and fun. So so they're born between 2013 and 2028. And their values include technological intuitiveness, global citizenship, adapting to change, and individualism, so far, at least. Yeah, yeah. So that's, again, this is sort of being defined as it comes along. But I think, you know, so defining circumstances of this that seem relevant to this generation are still kind of TBD. As I said, the first generation born in the 21st century, so whatever that might mean. But also we have some obvious ones, the COVID pandemic. Everything moved to streaming, and then we had this. Yeah. We have the ongoing streaming wars, uh-huh. music, music, live performances, everything. Yeah, we have the rise of AI, which I think will be no small impact on the next generation. We have the rise of influencers, which actually had been around before that. We did a whole episode on that, but uh, the, uh-huh. the major right. popularity, I think, in the word becoming much more well known. Right, CGI reach uh, has has begun to reach photorealism and escape the uncanny valley, which I think a lot mm-hmm. of people did not see coming. Nope, everyone seems to be at war right now. We're looking around the world, and there's so just mad. wars going on all over the place. Unfortunately, we have a major housing crisis with housing prices that have outpaced people's living wage by just laughably large margin. I mean, depressingly large, but also like it's so ridiculous. It's kind of funny kind of thing. Right. We have proliferation of education around the globe, which also revealed that we have a failing of education around the globe. Um, (laughs) Even as it continues to expand, we have had substantial medical breakthroughs. There was the Internet of Things. I don't know if if people remember that term from a, a few a few years back, but how like our dishwasher, our microwaves, and our refrigerators are now all on the internet. Um, uh-huh. That's like a thing yes. now. We are seeing the rise of the resurrection of fascism and authoritarianism around the world, and also so we're weird. moving into a period where there's the very visible and tangible effects of climate of global climate change are becoming as predicted much more realized right so that kind of i think altogether breaks down what each generation for the last hundred or so years has been experiencing but i think the reason we wanted to talk about this is because so often people will use and describe a certain set of behaviors as being a a generational thing rather than looking at maybe a circumstance or even just kind of understanding why that group of people or somebody from that group might have a certain set of characteristics and so I think it's worth maybe going into a little bit of the skeptical viewpoint of these generational characteristics specifically. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we we should always be skeptical about these things. And although we've more or less talked through them, I think fairly successfully in a way that did not necessarily paint a huge amount of bias over it. It's worth asking, like, are these even real? Is this actually a thing? Like, is there a point to any of this? As you had asked right at the front. Although, like, we sort of identified that this is arbitrary. Many have elected to define and name these generations for practical reasons, the baby boomers, etc. The idea of these generations are not at all scientifically validated. We can't actually specifically right. draw a line in the sand and say, like, no, this is it's really clear where this shift took place. It's completely like this seems like a logical place to say that there was a major change that we'd call this a separate generation. And another point, too, is that people on the fringes of the defined group, like people who are born early in that generation versus people who are born later in that generation, they tend to feel disconnected from the people on the opposite ends. So people born in 1996, they belong to pretty different circumstances and experiences than people born in 1981. And I think that that is a fair conclusion. I think we are, we'll say in the mid 80s, we're not going to give away our ages. (laughs) But like when I talk to somebody who was born in like the like the mid 90s, it's a very different conversation because of my just just from a pop culture experience, just having those conversations what we remember 
Absolutely. Like, I remember when Jurassic Park came out. Yeah. I remember when my family got our first cell phone. Right. I remember when we got hooked up to the internet and my mom was trying to explain email to me. Like, <laughs> those were things right. that someone who was born in, in like 1995, 1996, that stuff's done. Like, we're past all that. People have cell phones. Right. Jurassic Park has sequels. Email is a, is a relatively regularly accessible thing to most people at this point. So I, I do feel like someone who was was born in the earlier part of that swing of generations. I don't feel a lot of connection to someone who was born in the in the 90s and I feel more connection to someone who was born just a few years before me in the previous generation. Right. In the late 70s because not as much separates me from them as separates me from someone born in the same generation of me 15 years later or 14 years later, right. or 10 years later, you know. Right. For people our age, I think that we tend to have more shared experiences with people who are 10 years older than us than 10 years younger than us. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. So I think another part of this that's really important to unpack is that treating people as belonging to a group, it ends up oversimplifying their experience and their unique behaviors and the complexity of individuals and also it stereotypes the members of that group. While group identity can be useful in some circumstances, it might be preferred in some circumstances, and it might be empowering to some, it can distract away from understanding each of that person's unique circumstances, their own unique personalities, their own behavior sets. There's a lot of stuff that it kind of discards by overgeneralizing the characteristics of a generation. And just the idea of the generation, like some have pointed to, like, because we know these are arbitrary, we know that there's a lot of overlap and like it's not scientifically valid. But nevertheless, we're going to say that these are generations. It can actually create some unnecessary division and and for some people, some strife between those generations, even when they're fairly close. You know, like I said, people who were born just the generation before us that were like closer to in age than the people who were born at the end of our generation, like seeing them as belonging to a different group of people because we've said that they belong to a different group of people by identifying them as being part of a generation that's seemingly distinct from ours. And again, I think that's that's just unnecessary and places where we other people, we see problems. So like anything that sort right. of enables that is something to be wary of. Absolutely. So treating other people can be a problem and like based on their generations can be a problem. And in the book, The Generation Myth, Why When You're Born Matters Less Than You Think, Bobby Duffy, who is a UK researcher, argues a couple different points. First, he says, this is somewhat of a marketing ploy too. Like, so we're othering people based on just kind of a marketing scheme, which I think is an interesting take on this. Companies will hire quote unquote experts to consult about hiring and policies of a quote unquote multi-generational workforce. So basically they're hiring people to make it so that they can account for the different characteristics of different generations instead of just like looking at good organizational policies. Yeah, basically, this is a group of people who have come together to say, we are experts in generational characteristics. Hire our firm to help your business best support and account for the multi-generational workforce that you will or may have. Right. In an example of this, most of the websites, when I was looking for information about this, and and often as a behind-the-curtain sort of thing, I'll just sort of type some things into Google just to see what shows up. Like, I am usually have some places I'm going to go look, but I'm also just going to say what randomly populates when I just do a general search just to see if there's something that I, I, I might miss, right? And one of the things that popped up pretty much the first, like, entire page of search results, no matter how I wrote this, were websites for firms who are like, these are what generations are. This is why they matter. This is how we can help you leverage your business to account for these generational characteristics. Like that was almost every single website that I saw right out the gate, even from a couple of universities who sort of seemed like they were also pushing this idea. So it does seem like this is like a follow the money thing, right? Are generational characteristics real or is it something that people use to make money by saying, hire me so I can tell you how this thing impacts your business, whether or not it's real. And so just not to say that, like we pointed out earlier, the the people who describe this acknowledge like this is arbitrary and we know it's arbitrary. And here's like, we feel like it's worth unpacking these and, and identifying these circumstances. And so they do. And still, Saying like, yeah, but does it really matter though? Like it seems (laughs) like, again, if you're just trying to work as a consultant, 
Right. Maybe not. You know, we've kind of said it already where I think it's important that we can understand the circumstances of somebody's life to explain like maybe how they might have developed certain skills or certain opinions and stuff. I do think that that is important. But I think to apply that in a generational, like kind of a generational, like hand waving, like, well, yada, 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 they're a boomer, like this isn't really useful in that context. Right. That's kind of my general thought. Now, also in this book that we're talking about here from Bobby Duffy, every generation seems to follow an 80 year cycle of being characterized as idealist, reactive, civic, adaptive, and then it resets. And it's not unlike a horoscope or uh, in like kind of looking at the months of the year, like it's, it's yeah. very kind of easy to follow cyclical patterns. And that's really kind of how it gets recharacterized, even if it is not necessarily a cyclical pattern in place. Yeah. Well, and, and then if you think back to, and I should have pointed this out as we were going through how it seems like some words kept being used for different generations. Teamwork. They're like, they're up there. Yeah, teamwork came up a lot. Optimism came up a lot. Loyalty came up many times, but there was also like this progressive idealism came up pretty much every generation. Right. And definitely not one where we look on some of those past generations and say, those are very progressive people. They're not by today's <laughs> standards, but back then and when they were young, they, were. they seem to have been. And that sort of, I think, speaks to some other points we'll get to in a moment after the ads. We were talking about this book, The Generation Myth by Bobby Duffy, and he sort of says, like, rather than thinking of the generational characteristics as being important, there are sort of these three factors that might better explain how we talk about and understand where people sort of come from over these generations. And I think he makes some really good points that we'll have to sort of unpack as we go through. Right. So the first thing is this idea of a life cycle. People change as they age, which makes perfect sense. You get more experience, you get more exposure, you you change as you grow. Another one is period events, war, recession, disease outbreaks. Those are going to drastically influence how you respond to the world around you. And there's also uh, world events that happen during crucial personality development points, like early adulthood. I mean, I think of 9-11 specifically as a turning point for me and my experience. I think that I marked that as the time where I grew up. Fair. Because that was such a reality an exposure to reality for me and that was a major sure. world event i mean that i think influenced me so absolutely but that again that's how i took it and how everybody reacted around that is a different conversation but those three factors life cycle period events and world events that happen specifically during personality development points all three of those can drastically influence the majority of people inside a generation and that's exactly it. So in reading this, I think you could take away, well, he's just trying to explain generation using different words. But I actually think that, as you said, the point that he was making is when the first of all, people change as they age and they always like that just is a thing that happens. Right. But also like all these things happen to all people when they happen, meaning that someone who is of two generations behind we're around people who are like from the silent generation. It was that that far back in time. And there's they're here experiencing AI with us. They've been through right. the various diseases, outbreaks and wars that have happened. So, like, if they're shaped by those things, then they're shaped by those things at the same time that everyone else is. And it just so happens to be the case that, like, these things that happen, like, oftentimes when we look at these generations they're hitting these people during their development when they're getting into early adulthood, which is actually after the generation in which they were born. And so they're kind of being shaped by factors as when as they get into adulthood that really push their their opinions and beliefs in a certain direction that are actually not really relevant to the time that they were in. But again, like those world events happen to everybody all at once. Right. And so like no matter what we've been through, we're going to continue to change and be influenced by our current circumstances, no matter what generation we're in. Right. And then I think another part, too, is like looking at this kind of general cycle of how society just generally progresses. Yeah. What ends up happening is society progresses towards increased social justice. Most generations start off as idealists. They're principled youths who push for more and greater social equality at first and then turn into cynical bigots. I mean, you see that happen time and time again, and hopefully that cycle does start to break. But I think that's a pretty consistent thing that you start to see. It does feel like we're getting out of that. It seems like we're getting more firm and widespread pushes for kind of social justice issue as time goes on. But like that is society just does that. It moves towards this progressive egalitarian sort of worldview 
aside from these weird like moves into authoritarianism and to like murder genocidal things that seem to go on sometimes like in general the overall trend sort of tends to go that way so it's sort of like every generation feels like really progressive particularly when they're young and for at the time when they were young like they were being very progressive and that just keeps going like and so no matter where you slice it like you're going to find that sort of thing right the other thing here is the shifts in circumstance are sort of broader and more circuitous than one generation so for example if you look at like trends in the economy trends in the economy can span decades that are going to influence people across many of these so-called generations such that like those impacts will continue to affect them as they grow and change well into their late adulthood and the younger generation and as they move into adulthood. And so like those are just things that influence everybody. And there's also going to be sort of political boogeyman topics that also span these large generations. Like the right has been trying to scare people about the immigration boogeyman for like a long time now. Right. It hasn't always been their main talking point, but it's been successful enough that like xenophobia piece has been successful enough recently that they kind of just keep returning to that well as their main sort of fear mongering tactic. And I think like, that's just like a thing that happens that again, spans multiple generations is that you're going to have these sort of politically expedient fear tactics that keep working for a while, at least until they don't. And then they shift to a new boogeyman. But for right now, that's one of the big ones. Uh, So many boogeymen. There's also this kind of general increase in secularism. There's a lot of people moving away from religion and organized religion and kind of moving towards a space where this idea of spirituality is kind of shifting and changing and growing in so many different ways. And so that shift in general is going to influence a whole lot of people. I don't want to say it's very unlikely. The chances are never zero, but I have strong doubt that there's ever going to be another inquisition. Yeah, it does seem like we have moved away from the possibility of that. Short the total collapse of society. Sure. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, were we to fall back into this really isolated techno desert sort of world where Mad Max world, the Mad Max world, uh, then it's very possible we'd see that kind of thing again. But it seems as at the rate that we're going, unlikely that we'll ever move back to that sort of thing right but i've been surprised by world events recently so who knows yeah yeah exactly and there is i think another thing too uh, you mentioned it with the advancement of technology and stuff there is a radically unprecedented social media use that has started to kind of lead up to this like greater global community where there's more interconnection more powerful echo chambers than at any other point in history and you could see this happening at least in united states politics where People are becoming galvanized and radicalized inside their parties and becoming so divisive. I mean, it is a distinctly two-party system in the United States because nobody wants to talk to each other. (laughs) It's bizarre, but it is that's exactly what's happening is people are gathering information that's not accurate information from their echo chambers and getting reinforced in these spaces. And now you're creating kind of these like pockets of people who are experts but not experts. And it's a mess. It's really a mess. Is what my point is is that human beings are a mess right now. We need to tighten up. We need to do better. <laughs> well, and, and sort of, yeah, uh, the, there has been the effect that communities are kind of no longer geographical, or at least they don't have to be. You can have really tight-knit communities that, that are spread around the world. It can allow people to connect to cultures they're not used to, to ways of talking and thinking about things that they're not used to. And that definitely happens as an outcome of mm-hmm. social media and the internet. But the other thing that happens is that they tend to find these communities and then sort of wall themselves off and turn into a self-reinforcing momentum machine of usually some kind of fear about something or advocacy about something or whatever. But it then just creates the like, we're not listening to anybody else thing. And I think both of those happen in various capacities. You have some, you know, little column A, little column B, et cetera. So um, that is a thing that definitely is is shifting and is nothing like that's ever happened. Like we don't have anything to compare this to. Yeah. So we don't really know what to expect. This is the first time we've had this technology available to us. Right. Like we're at the stage now where people are starting to realize it's kind of like the whose line is it anyway rules. But when it comes to geopolitics is the borders (laughs) aren't real and the politicians don't matter. (laughs) 
<laughs> that was a very good reference for anybody who's ever watched Who's Line, is it? Anyway? <laughs> ah, millennials, you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think the last thing here is just talk about sort of, um, as we said, this is largely American centric. And so I was kind of curious, as you know, worth looking around and seeing what others have said about how this relates to global issues in other countries around the world. And one thing that I sort of found and that was pointed out is that to an extent, these generations do still apply, kind of to other countries in the world, largely because some of these major events affected everybody. So we have World War I that actually did not affect everybody. It did, did have quite a few countries involved, more so than you would normally expect. Right. World War II had a lot, I think, larger of a global impact. We were definitely at a point where trade was more global at this point. The 1918 flu affected many people in many countries around the world. COVID shut down the whole right. world. One of the rare circumstances where it was like, wow, there is nobody who is not touched by this in some way. Right. That pandemic. Everybody around the world, we went from like having no international air travel to having common international air travel. Like, right. That was a really big game changer that will have affected everybody. We have the rise in exponential growth of technological complexity, and that includes things like the internet, that all countries. Got Again, they were touched by these in some way, and that was one that I think touched all countries, or the vast majority of them. And then, of course, the the big one that's affecting everyone is climate change. Like, it doesn't matter where you live. This is going to affect you more so in, I think, places that are at the extremes of the globe, but we're seeing it everywhere now. Right. Those are factors to consider, like, if there's anything to this in terms of the fact that I said it's very American, like, some of these things everybody experienced. And so, like, the and those will be pivotal moments during someone's development. But again, they do happen to everybody around the world. So there's that. Right. And there's also just considering what we've seen in the last century when it comes to geopolitics, right? There's the rise and fall of the Nazi party in Germany. There's the rise and fall of the Soviet Union, the beginning of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. China established the People's Republic of China Communist Dictatorship Party, you know, and several countries have had civil wars that have resulted in independence from their host countries. Some countries saw economic booms and collapses from oil. Some just saw booms. Others just saw collapses. And that is everyone was experiencing different hardships and struggles at different pivotal times throughout the last century. So I think it would be irresponsible to apply generational values and generational characteristics internationally only because in some circumstances, those contexts are so unique, so different. I mean, you're talking about Japan experiencing a long period of isolationism as a result of their like it's part of it self-imposed and part of it being mandated by everybody after World War II and that creating its own unique culture where every generation has its own characteristics and stuff. I mean, there's so much to unpack I, Australia as an example, where Australia has really only been able to connect with everybody pretty recently due to the Internet. Yeah. For a long time, they were very isolated because they were effectively the lost continent. For up until like the 1960s, they were like almost a very difficult to access space compared to other parts of the world. And so you've got these different hardships that exist in different places. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that piece, too. Yeah. And just as you said, like there there are some that like we don't even really talk about because they didn't affect as directly the United States that were major, major events for others. Uh, North Korea going super isolationist was another one. Right. The partitioned India when Britain sort of left India was a major upheaval that like to them was like there was a time before this and a time after this. And this was a period in the history books or the history of this country that was a major dividing point in the social structure of India. And like and that was 1947. Like that was, again, just within the last century. So like to them, that was a huge shift. I mean, we're talking apartheid and apartheid. Yeah. In South Africa, you've got the civil war in Rwanda and Congo, like all these places that this is happening, that there's like civil unrest and the effect that it has had on so many people. I mean, you know, and this is not a world history lesson. By any means. Kind but what is. it is, is looking at, I mean, it kind of is. I mean, for those of you who didn't know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on out there. Just from a geopolitical standpoint, the amount of change that has happened for specific people in individual countries, for changing governments, for the rise and fall. I mean, this has happened for centuries and decades well before we established the boomer generation was a thing. But it's really important to know that that does influence and characterize and galvanize a certain group of people because like you said 
that experience for whoever is in that space is happening to everybody in that space. Right. Yes. Yeah. Very important point. And, and again, it doesn't even matter sort of wh- where they're at age wise, like that will be a thing that affects their ability to navigate their world for the rest of their lives or until the next major cataclysmic sort of thing happens. So that that's a really important piece to just think about, like how we talk about generations and how that relates to the rest of the world, which they're just going through different stuff. I mean, we all go through some of the similar stuff and then everybody goes through different stuff. And now you have to go through ads. I think we've sort of hit all the things that we wanted to talk about with this. Is there anything that I missed or anything you'd like to add about the generational characteristics before we we sort of start to wrap up here? I think for people who maybe subscribe to a contextual or circumstantial worldview, this is probably not anything surprising in terms of like kind of landing on like, yeah, circumstances matter. And this is probably going to lead to other episodes like birth order that we'll probably have to have a conversation about at some point in time, too. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good point. If you didn't pick it up from us, I think at least my thesis is that like analyzing anybody's behavior, understanding anybody's behavior requires a circumstances worldview, not necessarily a generational worldview. Yeah, it's not going to tell you much about anyone. And, you know, I was kind of thinking about I forgot to mention this earlier, so I'm I'm glad we, we took a moment to reflect on if there was anything left to add. And something I had sort of thought about in talking about these these world events and these pivotal moments of like, as you're sort of coming into adulthood and you're forming your independent personality out on your own, that's common in the United States around, you know, 18, 20 years old, the major events that happen during that period are going to be things that might be they're, they're going to influence sort of how you turn out. But again, it won't be predictive enough that it'll be able to say anything about who you are or what you actually value or what you're ever going to do. Like it's it's way too imprecise for anything even kind of close to that. And if you think about it, too, like it would also force people in to be a part of the groups that were affected during that during sort of those critical development periods to be fairly short. Like you're looking at windows of like four ish years of like, you know, someone born between 2012 and 2016 have us kind of a more shared history there going all the way from like 2013 to 2026 is pretty different. Right. Like, honestly, a lot of people say, and I think understandably, we think about before the pandemic and after the pandemic, the pandemic being at one of those big punctuation marks in world history. Yeah. That radically shifted things. And the Gen Alpha or the the supposedly Gen Alpha people, they span the before and after of that. Yeah, that's like a a mile marker in there. Yeah, pragmatically, the sort of three years where that sucked all the air out of the room, like people who were coming into adulthood during that, they were trying to get married during that, they were having babies during that, they were like just entering the workforce during that and then not able to get a job because they had no experience and couldn't leave their house. Like, right. that is going to be a thing that is going to be more memorable for them than the people who were born and, and experiencing later adulthood after that. So I was just thinking that like, if there were to be generations, I think that the time period for which they could have a a major influential event is like right at that sort of early adulthood piece is going to be very short window. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Okay. We do like to recommend movies, music, events, activities, and things sometimes, and, and just often just completely unrelated to the topic that we were just discussing. But they're fun, and we like to share them with people, so we will do that now. But first, what we need to do is say thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd like to support the show, you can leave us a rating and review, subscribe, join us on Patreon, pick up some merch, tell a friend. And if you do do the whole join us on Patreon thing, then uh, we will read your name. We will say, hey, everybody who is listening to this, you should know that there's this awesome group of people to which you could belong, and I will say your name. And that includes Mike M., Megan, Layla, Mike T., Justin, Kim, Joshua, Brad, Stephanie, Olivia, Brian, Ashley, and Kiara. Thank you all so much. Forever and for always, we really appreciate you. We love you all. Thank you for being here. In addition, I could not do this without my team of people who really uh, allow me to do this fun project that is the Silly Little Podcast, and that includes our audio production and editing from Justin Greenhouse, fact checking and writing from Shane and myself. Thank you again so much for recording with me today, Shane. Hey, anytime. Thanks for having me. And of course, Emma Wilson is our social media coordinator, and thanks to everyone who is listening. We appreciate you. Is there anything that I missed or anything that you'd like to add to that part before we get to our recommendations? No, I think we're good. Perfect. All right. Join us on Patreon. Anyway, let's recommend some things. Yay. Yay.
recommendations. I would like to recommend a conference, okay. but it's not any sort of conference. You know, I am somebody who is a great appreciator of all things nerd media. <laughs> and I say that in the most loving way. Oh, yeah. This is a good thing. Yeah. Yesterday, as of this recording, I got to go to Megacon 2024, which is like okay. the Orlando, Florida version of Comic-Con. And all the actors come and they visit. Tom Hiddleston was there yesterday. Whoa. Rain Wilson was there. Gina Davis. Damn. Neville Longbottom. I can't remember what his name is right now, but he was there. I got to see him up close and personal. Wow. I got to meet Roger Lima from Less Than Jake by accident. And he gave me a... <laughs> um, yeah, I ran into him, and he swiftly, out of his pocket, pulled out a garbage pail, like a less than Jake version of a garbage pail kid's trading card. That was him, and uh, his name's Rotten Roger, and I was like, okay, this is great. Like, what a great collectible that I didn't expect to get. That's fabulous. But, you know, if you've never been, it's a very big, like, almost like a showcase where you've got vendors that are selling their wares, their art. There's a whole artist alley. You can get tattooed. It's in people cosplaying, and it's just a really wonderful experience. It was very busy yesterday, but it is st- it was still a very great Wonderful experience and getting to see all the people in costume and doing some really cool work and seeing all the different games that are out and seeing it was just really a great experience. So I recommend if you've never been to like a comic book convention, go to one because you are going to have the best time. I feel like maybe we should just do a uh, like a an episode that's like the history of Comic-Con or maybe comic book conventions more generally or. Yeah. Or maybe a survey of like the existing conventions that are sort of these nerd slash pop culture convention type things. Yeah. I think that'd be fun. That'd be great. I would love that. Uh, Sort of speaking of that, I guess, is uh, I'm recommending a movie. Uh, This movie came out, I believe, in 2021 or 22, maybe before that. It's not that recent. It's a fairly newer movie, but not that new, like not in the last year. Yeah, definitely not in the last year. I'm going to look it up really quick because now I want to know. 2021. So it's a, it's a few years old at this point. This is an A24 film. It's called The Green Knight based on the story Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is a book, a very old book, which I would also recommend. But um, the movie The Green Knight, really interesting a movie. In a good way, it's weird, but it is so beautifully, beautifully shot. I mean, just incredible yeah. camera work. The acting is great. It's got this very surrealist quality to it. That I think it actually really works with how they tell the story. It's one of those where you do have to pay attention. So know that going into it, it's not like a look up from your phone every once in a while and see what noise is happening on the screen. Like you should kind of be watching, but it is a a really interesting film. I really enjoyed it. So I think if you're interested in things like that, the sort of very artsy, very beautifully shot, well-made sort of weirdish movie um I, I i think you could do a lot worse than than the green knight and i think that that's currently available on amazon prime i could be wrong but uh it's out there so if you want to go look for it it uh, should be available you know a24 films is doing some really cool stuff and so um they're probably my favorite studio right now because they are doing that weird stuff everything everywhere all at once is on a24 so yes uh full backing of this one i think they've got to be one of the most reliable studios for their like quality Uh, yeah you probably won't like every movie that they put out but every movie that they put out feels like it was like no we wanted to make a good film and we tried our best to do that right versus so many studios who are like we just needed to get something out the door so that we could you know call it for tax purposes or you know (laughs) sure bottom line or satisfy investors a24 feels like they're really trying to do it right they're very intentional about what they put out yeah yeah so i guess bonus recommend for a24 (laughs) <laughs> yeah i love it well if you'd like to tell us about your generation generational characteristics your skepticism or your belief in what those things mean you should reach out to us directly you can email us at info at www.podcast.com or you can also talk to us about the green knight or your favorite comic con like convention and we enjoy hearing those things so we want to hear from you even if it's just to say hi we enjoy that too reach out to us on social media as well you will talk to emma or you'll talk to us and all of that works really well so please do that We look forward to hearing from everyone. And I think that is all that I have. So I think I'm going to say that this is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening. And we hope you have an awesome day. 